I'd like to welcome everybody to West Middle School. I believe this is the, the last stop on a lengthy tour by our new superintendent, Kathleen Smith. And I'm about to introduce a gentleman by the name of Richard Bath, who is the chairman of her transition uh, team. And is going to say a few words and make some introductions, and then we'll get right to the reason you're here. And that's the conversation with our new superintendent. Mr. Bath? Thank Thanks, Cliff. One of the best principals on the planet, uh, Cliff Murray, does a great job over here. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge a couple of people here. We have Andy, Andy Robinson, school committee member from Ward 2, okay? And the mayor for the next couple of years, Linda Belzard, <laughs> sitting right here. Thank you for coming, Mayor. Andy, thank you for coming. As Cliff said, this is the last of the listening tour. So we saved the best for last. West is best. And the reason why I say that is my children graduated from West. So uh, it is the best. And I was on the parent council here for a long time. But anyway, what we want to try to do tonight, the purpose of this meeting here, and this is the fourth in the series of what we call, what we deem the listening tour. We want to hear from the parents sitting in the audience tonight. We want to hear what your concerns are. We want to hear from you specifically about what you would like to see uh, with the Brockton Public Schools going forward. And, and you have the boss tonight for, seven, for 60, possibly 70 minutes. So use this time to ask her the questions that are on your mind. And, we ask, and, and like I said, we specifically want to hear from parents and faculty members who are here. Okay, and some of the new people who are running for school committee. I know there's a few here tonight, but this is what we really particularly want to hear from you guys. Uh, this, like I said, this will be the last of the meetings, and then we're going to go and take all of the information that we've had from this, and then we're going to start compiling a strategic plan for the next five years that Superintendent Smith is going to uh, put together. We also have a series of subcommittee meetings that are going on as well. And we expect to have all of this information uh, all put together, and all of the meetings will end just uh, at the end of November. So we will use December and January to write the report, and then Superintendent Smith will unveil the report to the school committee and in public. Okay, so without any further ado, let me introduce Kathleen Smith, the superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools. said this is, I have to make sure this is on, uh, this is the last of the so-called listening tours. Um, you know, people talk all the time about new superintendents coming in, doing entry plans, having an opportunity to talk to people in the community, to parents, to elected officials, to community members. And, you know, starting out, I think this is the, the sixth of the listening tours. Uh, I've had interpreters at East Middle School for our Cape Meridian community. I sat with our Haitian community and had interpreters, and the information has been absolutely fabulous. And I thank you for giving up your time. I know there are people out here that have come to two and even three meetings, and I appreciate that. It tells me you're invested in the schools, and like me, you want the best that we could possibly have for our children in the Brockton Public Schools. So that is my goal. As Richard explains, the hard work starts after tonight. It starts putting together all of the information we've heard from the parents and the community. All of the information coming from administrators, principals, paraprofessionals, custodians, union members, people from throughout our district to make sure that we're moving forward in a direction that is fiscally responsible for us, that gives our children an opportunity to be successful and competitive in a global economy. And I think everybody is here for those same reasons. So tonight again, um, I, I want to hear what you have to say and understand when Richard men mentions West, my daughters, my two daughters also went to West uh, at the time, I think it was West Junior High, now West Middle School, so this is also a very special place to me. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here. I want to thank uh, Principal Cliff Murray, his staff, I know there are a number of you here tonight, and uh, again, very special evening. So we can begin. Could you just introduce yourselves, please? Sure. My name is Danielle Kenneth. My son um, is fortunate enough to be in the two-way language program at the George School. He just started off this year in kindergarten. Um, so my question for you is, um, 
I know that there's really, you're not gonna be able to answer this question, but I would like it to be, I don't know, in your, maybe your plan for the next three years. But my question is, who has the care, custody, and control of the George School athletic field? And is there a plan to open up the George School field or replace the field? Currently the field is fenced in, gate is chained and locked. Okay, so the George School field is behind the school heading towards the DW Fields field Park. Okay, I think I've been out there once. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize it was changed. I'm going to say, uh, Mayor Belzotti, you're here, but I think the school owns that field. There are some fields that the city owns right. that they maintain, but I think that is actually one of our fields. So your concern, again, is you have a beautiful field in back of the George School and it's not accessible to, to 960. It's not accessible during the day if the principal or the visit teacher chooses to use it? My understanding is that since the school has been built, like I've asked about this because I coach my son's soccer team, sure. so I thought, oh, how wonderful. I'll pick him yeah. up and we'll have practice there. And um, anyone that I've spoken to about the field has said that the field has major drainage issues and has been that way since day one, that, um, that there's um, issues with um, some mosquito control and they're just concerned of maybe liabilities of students, I don't know, you know, getting any mosquito-borne illnesses. Yeah. So it just seems very unfortunate and it seems to be the only solution is to have it, you know, new drainage put in, which I know is a big expense. And um, I just, it's, it's just a shame that it's only five years old and apparently wasn't done properly. Okay. Um, so as I said, I know I understand that you're not going to be able to answer all these questions tonight, but if you can just keep that. Well, one of the things I will do with a question like this, I would like you to give your name to Jocelyn Meek, our communications director, and that's something that I can follow up sooner than later. What I do when I get back tomorrow is I start to take a look at, there are some questions that you can answer now, in the here and now, and it makes a difference. It's interesting to hear you talk about that because just this past weekend, I went to uh, a beautiful gala uh, for the DJ Henry Dream Fund, and I'm not sure yes. if you know what that is about. But it's a family from Easton. Their son was killed three years ago while attending Pace University. Uh, rather than put their heads in the sand, it was a family that got together with the support of friends, and they have put together their mission to make sure the kids have access to anything from the arts to sports, and. What they showed on Saturday night was a video, and it showed a young kid looking inside at a fenced-in area. And it was kids playing football, and what the message was was he didn't have access to that field. And of course, in the end, with the video, by way of the DJ Dream Fund, they were able to give him scholarship. And what a difference it made in that kid's life to be able to play, you know, football. But what a difference it makes in our kids' lives to look at playgrounds that they can utilize. And you know a number of the packs. I know Hancock, uh, I think Kennedy has done it. And probably there are others out there that you've taken time to fundraise to make sure that your kids have a great place to play, a place to reunite with other kids. So that really is unacceptable. You sound like you have more information than I do at this point. You know, about yeah, the been, fields. Yeah. I see Mr. Robinson here. I'm not sure if that's something that's come up at school committee. Truth to George, specifically no. Yeah. Um, I literally just stumbled upon it because I was yeah. looking online at researching the different schools in my zone sure. before my son even got to 2A. And then he got in and I, I had the dilemma. I had to pick up daycare, pick up here from kindergarten, and then I'm the soccer coach, get to the field. So I was oh, it's, per it's perfect. And so that's, I just kind of, I just stumbled upon it and I saw this path and I went down and I said, oh my goodness. Just, just like the secret just garden. make sure you give Jocelyn your name and contact him. Okay, thank you for your help with that. Okay. Hi, I teach over at the Ashfield, and I do the um, extended day in the summer over at the George School. And even like the hottest months of August, when there's no rain, that we don't use those fields because there is water that seeps up through the ground, and it's, they told us not to use them for a liability issue. So it's definitely the case over at the George. Um, oh, you? Oh, okay. So you've had experience summer with that. There. And even when it hasn't rained, the water still, the ground still always like kind of soaking wet. No, Extended day wants to do like a field, like an end of the year celebration or something. And, um, Usually we don't use that field, we'll use the other areas over at the George or we'll go to the DW Field Park, but you, that field you can't use because of the water. So. Well, we will certainly look into this. Thanks, Morgan. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sue Reichenberg. I'm here on behalf of Rockland Faith Community. I attended 
the mayor's uh, conference last Friday on the, um, the mayor's opioid overdose prevention uh, coalition. And the first um, program, the first segment, was uh, called Photo Voice. And there were eight young people of high school age who were given questions and they talked about it. They were given cameras. They took incredible photographs and talked about them. At the last session, what they came up with was the fact that they don't, they believe that there isn't enough education on drugs and its importance in the school. They feel there's an overemphasis on bullying. I can't comment on that, but I'm, I'm most concerned about the fact that they feel that there is not enough uh, education on drugs. It's such a, such a terrible problem, not just in the city, but throughout the country. And I would just bring it up as a suggestion. Yeah. And for full disclosure here, Sue and I are dear friends. Um, and she and I both have, have talked about things that have happened in our own neighborhood. Many of you know I live here. I've lived here for 30 years. We've looked at some of our families with kids that come from good homes. You know, we always want to blame the social ills for why kids get into drugs. That's not necessarily so. And actually, I had an opportunity to attend part of the conference on Friday that you're talking about. And they talked about the young person's brain and, and what happens to them as they go along. So Sue brings up the question about we, do we do enough education? As far as our health classes go, our wellness classes, we do have a particular curriculum that we use. And when something happens like the bullying that happened in our very state a couple of years ago, it now is a law, a law that had mandated so-called reporters, things that we have to do to follow up on bullying. And all of a sudden, that becomes a priority and, and part of our curriculum. I'm not sure, Sue, is when you talk about drugs, people want to say, not me, not my family. Well, that's not the case, and it isn't just Brockton. It isn't just an urban issue. You look around at our neighboring towns. Everybody's having the issue to the point that we actually opened up two years ago now, Mayor. We opened up the um, Independence Academy yeah. at the site of, uh, it was the old Belmont School site uh, on Belmont Street. So we are part of a collaborative approach to pay attention, but Sue asks about education. We can do a better job. You know, I'm 58 years old, and I will tell you that we sit and we talk about some things that the schools are dealing with. Sexting issues. You know, you talk about the drug issues. You know, there are things that it's not about turning a blind eye. We have to figure out how we can support the families, and we do great at saying, we're talking right now about having some kind of a forum. Not just the parent academies that Jane Farley does an excellent job with, invites parents in to hear about all kinds of issues all year long. Many of you attend those forums. But also something like, again, the use of the cell phones and pictures, and, and I'm going to show you my lack of knowledge about this. I don't have Facebook. I don't have a lot of the social media type things. But I know you're out there dealing with your own children. And we're right now talking as an executive team about how we get that message across to bring you together to talk to you about some of the legal consequences, what happens to kids. And this is, again, one of those issues with drugs that we can do a better job. Um, and it's not just, you're not talking to me about educating the parents. You're talking about when we have the kids as kids going from elementary to middle school and to high school and to make sure we have really a dedicated curriculum, you know, for that purpose. So it is something, you know, I, I will look at. You know, when Sue brings up that point, the other thing is we have so many mandates coming down right now about time spent on every subject that, you know, we don't just need to lengthen the school day and year, which isn't a bad idea. That comes with a cost to our community. But again, these are issues that, as your superintendent, I won't turn a blind eye to it, and we will take a look at you know, how we can do a better job, because we can do a better job. This was definitely not one uh, question on the top of my list, but it came up today, and since you just brought up sex in, I don't think I'll be here at the end of the, day, the, end of the meeting to ask you about it, so I'll ask you now. Um, a friend of mine whose um, child goes to the Boston public schools mentioned to me that there was an issue with the child accessing pornography on the computer. And since we have our children using computers so much in all the classes, I was very surprised that schools have not come up with a way of, you know, you know, not allowing kids to access that type of stuff on, in school. 
So I was wondering if we have that under control? We, we have a wall that we certainly can. Now, I can't tell you the kids haven't penetrated it. They're smarter than we are. And every time we think we're ahead of the game, they find a way somehow to get beyond that. One of the things that I think we're very careful about in Brockton is not only the, the protection that we put up there, but again, teachers need to be active in moving around the classroom, the computer lab, just like you need to do at home. I'm sure you have some kind of filters at home, and yet you're foolish as parents if you're not paying attention to every single thing that they're doing and, and what they're looking at, so. And another small question. Um, camera surveillance, do we have a lot of that in the high schools and schools like around? We had an excellent grant. I want to call it the REMS grant, am I correct? Cops grant, okay. We've had, we've had some really good safety and security grants that we have been able to put video, put cameras. Is it enough? You know, it's never enough. Last year, the school committee made a commitment and we had Tobias Cowens hired under a grant for our safety and security. And he is tough. He's tough out there with our principals, making sure he'll walk around this building. He'll make sure that every door is closed. And if not, he'll be in the principal's office, you know, telling the principal, you know, somebody put a wedge in the door, maybe they had to run out to the car. We're trying in all of the schools with our teachers that go from school to school to have access through a fob or through their badge that allows them to come in and out of a building. You know, we're, we're not there yet. We've done it at the high school. There are a number of schools that are on our list. But it's something that we don't want to be caught. And, and again, you look at Newtown. I mean, they had excellent security in Newtown, Connecticut, and we know what happened. So it is important for us. Safety and security is a priority. Again, where it fits in the budget, we have been really fortunate as a district that goes after grant funding and will continue to do that. And the commitment from the school committee to actually hire Tobias Collins when the grant ended, we hired him full time to continue to look at ways that we can be a safer school. Thank you. They used to have, um, in, the, in the past, in the middle school, the, the two programs, great and dare. I don't see them anymore. Uh, what happened to those programs? I know we have school resource officers in the buildings, and I believe they're teaching our students, they're working with groups, or? That, that program has ended, but we still have the 20 school officers. Right. Now, the great program now, I can remember my daughter, I, I have to tell you, please, uh, I hope you take this from where it comes. My daughter is now 27 years old. She has red hair at the time, she's taller than every other kid at the middle school here, she's got big glasses. And at the, uh, the idea back then with great was gang, education, something, resistance. Right. And I can remember her coming home upset and saying to me, who would want me in a gang? You know, she thought that was ridiculous that she would have to attend a class like this. So all of, the, all of the school resource officers this summer, all of the police officers on the um, school department, police staff, were all went through great training. So while they may not specifically necessarily do the the full program, they were all trained this summer uh, to work towards that. So I just and I'm glad you reminded me, Mayor Belzotti, because I know Officer Kevin Smith was excited that he's one of our school police officer, not school resource officer, which are your Brockton police officers that are in the middle schools. And they were excited because even our school police officers having That's that training, I'm sorry, they all went. Having the training felt that they wanted to be in the classrooms working with the kids about the dangers that they're facing walking home from school, you know, things things that are, you know, I jo I'm not joking about games, but you know, that's very real for some kids. It is. And, and it puts them on a path uh, of certainly no success. Right. Um, and the, the DEA program, that was at our elementary level, and, and a lot of that is funding that comes from the state and federal government, and many times when it goes away, it's difficult for us to assume it in our budget because there are always other priorities coming down. But you found that helpful with your children, or? Well, you know, my oldest daughter, who's 27 too, she, uh, she actually did the great program over at East uh, Junior High. But then now with my son, I don't see anything like that. Yeah. Where did your son go to school? School South Middle. Goes to South, uh-huh. <coughs> no, something we'll follow up on. As I said, we have had, I'm glad the mayor reminded me, we just had training this summer. Awesome. My name is uh, 
My name is Angel, and um, I'm here uh, as a parent of Josiah Cosman, who uh, attends this wonderful school here. Um, and he's extremely happy to be here today. So um, I'm also uh, a history teacher at Independence Academy, so oh. um, the school that you mentioned. And I we do. definitely address um, you know, substance abuse and academics in, in our school. Um, I uh, volunteer with, with Vic, uh, and we're trying to address you know, the issue of, of uh, drugs in the city. And, um, I just wanted to offer uh, you know, any support in terms of uh, addressing that. I, I, um, I have some experience in um, drug and alcohol education, as well as tobacco education, which is something that's oftentimes left out. Um, it still remains the number one cause of death and illness in the United States. Um, but so I wanted to lend my support in, in that arena, but also um, my son's uh, school here at West, um, he was a little bit delayed in bringing his after school program uh, form, and I understand that he's on the waiting list. So my question is, uh, is there any um, possibility that there would be either more funding or more opportunities for those kids that are on the waiting list who couldn't get in? Okay, a, a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, it, it's great that you're here and offering your support. Because as we do talk about, you know, educating, you know, about drugs, about alcohol, about tobacco, all of those kinds of things that, again, you know, we don't need our kids involved in. Um, you know, I'm very happy if you give your name to Jocelyn. I haven't gotten out to Independence Academy. I will come, I will come out to make a visit. You know, I know you're there. I was there for your opening, uh, but I'd very much like to partner with you as we start to talk about, you know, ways we can educate our middle and high school students especially. As far as after school, again, last night, I have to tell you, when you talk about after school programs, our after school programs are funded by grants, 21st century grants, and we have seen them dwindle. One of the first jobs I had administratively was working in community schools back in 2001, and Mayor, I hate to tell you this, but we had more money than we knew what to do with. At the time, Jack Units was mayor. He received targeted cities grant funding, made sure it came to the school. I had 21st century grant funding. We had after school, out of school grant money that came from the state. We have so many, we probably had six or 7,000 kids in after school programs. I see, I see many of you here that worked with me in those programs. Kids were after school four days a week. We had families going to museums on Saturdays with their kids as part of this grant. We were able to do summer programs that went for 20 and 30 days long. And these were, again, the numbers were huge. And it was when MCAS was coming in, and it really made a difference to extend that learning time for those children that really needed it. Those children that were you know, falling you know, below average, that were having difficulty with MCAS. So unfortunately, those funds have dried up. Now when I say that to you, again, you know, we have to place priority as far as our budget goes where you know where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck a lot of that is during the school day focusing on the school day but there are many kids that still need that additional time at the end of a school day if you look at our Huntington Elementary School they have an extended learning time grant as we speak they have it for three years every one of their kids gets an extra hour after school and it's fun things it's things with the arts it's sports, it's enrichment activities. And looking at their MCAS scores, which I've had an opportunity to look at the past couple of months, they showed gains in that school in a very difficult uh, area, uh, high poverty rate, so it makes a difference for kids. Now, on another note, last night Mr. Robinson and I sat in on a subcommittee meeting of the school committee, and one of the things that we made a commitment to was an additional grant and development writer. So this has to go before the school committee to be finalized, but it is something that we're focusing on to try to see. We don't want to leave any money out there. If there's money that we qualify for as a district, we're not only trying to build capacity in a central office, we're trying to build capacity with your teachers. So here at West, I would like to see a teacher leader working with my grants and development office so teachers are out there also building capacity so they can go after grants for individual schools. Uh, last Tuesday night at the school committee, we had a teacher, I think, from the Iron Own School, who on her own had gotten a grant for, what was it, $3,000? Yeah, about $3,000 for iPads. And it was for iPads, and it was social iPods. studies. iPods. 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 It was social studies where they're actually walking and getting exercise by having a lesson with the iPod. Parents were thrilled. Other teachers were looking to do the same. 
So again, it's all about building capacity and making sure that we're getting you know, everything that we can for our kids, but it does make a difference. Now you asked me about your wait list here, so I'm gonna throw that to, to Principal Murray. Actually, this is our first week of the 21st century, and uh, we have the opportunity to work with our students to get them my interview back in March uh, of 2013, one of the things I talked about at the time, again, I'm going back to one of my own daughters, and she went to a high school that required her to have community service. And at the time, I think she was also doing her confirmation. And during that time, she volunteered at the Lewison House. And after months of being there, it made a difference as far as giving back to the community. I can remember the Christmas holidays came along, and she said to me, and she was young at the time, and she said, Mom, they, they, they don't have the crayons and the pencils, and when we do projects, I have all of these things at home. And I loved the fact that that's what we did for that holiday. We went out and got things. You know, she baked cookies, and, and, and kids really learn. You know, this is my daughter, again, that's 27. To this day, she has a heart, and she understands what it truly means to do community service. She also did it at the high school, where, as a senior, she was required to go to, it actually was an elementary school uh, in the district she was attending, and she had to go to that third grade every week for, I think it was two or three hours. And she committed to doing that, again, the whole school year. So you're right, you know, we can't expect kids to be going out there and finding places. You know, we as a district, first of all, I think one of the questions, and that was at my interview, you know, when do we start something like this? You happen to be in schools that are requiring it. So the Plough Academy is requiring the community service. And they said for, for um, liability reasons, they can't, they don't want to give us a list, but it's really difficult because if you call like a nursing home or whatever, no one wants to deal with a 12-year-old right. around. So it, I did find one place, the Salvation Army, that you know was you know that accepted um, help from 12-year-olds. Yeah. But other than that, I want if my child is going to do community service, I want it to be meaningful, you know, not just. And I agree with you because it makes a difference for the rest of their lives. You know, if, if it is something that. You know, we need to again approve in the district. You know, a place that we feel is safe for children. Yeah, just a list of places that parents can go to. But it's more than that. You know, as I said, it's something that it is on my radar. I'd like to see that as a requirement for your graduation. You know, if you graduate, you need, and we need to provide you an opportunity. But again, I would like to see that for kids throughout the district. And we all know, living in Brockton, there certainly are plenty of places that would open themselves up to community service. We have a lot of 
you know, community agencies. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, Kitty Haven, you know, Brockton Day Nursery, a place where there are little kids. Kids could develop lessons. Our own elementary schools. We have 11 elementary schools. We have 11 extended day sites. You know, part of it could be, you know, logistical issue with transportation and things that kids can do. But certainly, you know, other districts do it. Uh, kids do it all over the country, and we can do a better job of it here in Brockton. something organized through the Boy Scout organization? They were able to find placements for the kids? Is that what you're saying? Um, the Boy Scouts, yes, because they do require uh, that the children do community service, so they find the places for them. Now, these other two things are mostly because we already knew the people, um, but they, at the uh, PetSmart, uh, for this young lady that, I, that she was talking about, a 12-year-old, more than likely they'll take them. Good suggestion, thank you. But again, something we can do better. It's okay, thank you. Sure, I just want, yeah, just want to make sure everyone had a chance. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> yeah. um, I, my question is, could the district have an opt-in or opt-out parent contact list for their child's classroom? I asked because I, my son um, had a little Halloween parties, and it was hard, especially in kindergarten. And I know that they do that in the Reno Public Schools, and so, I mean, I work full time, and obviously other students take the bus home, and, and so it's hard for me to make contact with parents because I'm working, they're working, that's something okay, that so, possibly so, do. So the question that came, again, you, you do little social events for your child, so opt-in or opt-out means parents say, yes, you can give out my family information. So you're asking for like a parent's contact information. Right, so the classroom, like all the friends in the room. Right, so they'd be like a home contact number or cell number of the parent, is that what we're saying? Correct, yeah. yeah. Um, this is, you know, I had never heard of this before, so this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, it's funny because, again, when my children went to school, one of the things we said was, if we had a party, you invited, well, I had, I had little girls. Right. So you invited every little girl in the class. You didn't pick and choose. That was our rule at home. Yeah, if you had a little birthday party. and uh, So that's... That is a good idea. Um, you know, I, I think, think that's something, something like that, that in Reno. I don't know the specifics, but I mentioned it to people at work, and they said, "Oh, yeah, that's what we do in my child's classroom." I mean, it's nice because if you want to be an involved parent when you're working full time, you're really limited, and you can host, you know, families at your house. And it's right. Nice. So it sounds it's like nice. a sheet must go home to the parent, and yeah. I'm not sure how it's worded. If you would like right. other parents to be able to contact you for play dates, you know, for parties, for social events. Would you be willing to share your contact information, you know, is the question. Right, and it might be, you know, something where you want to cut off at a certain grade. I mean, obviously at some point the kids can get right, that information get themselves, but yeah. I mean, at kindergarten, what can I do? Well, I, again, I have the communications specialist sitting right here, and we can, we can start to talk to uh, our principals and uh, 
get an idea. It, it sounds to me like it's something doable. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so important. I think some of the relationships you make as parents, so, you know, our daughters, you know, the one rule in our house was if you started an event, you had to finish it. So if you signed up for soccer because you drove me crazy, you know, I would go with you, but you were going to finish the season. And you probably all have gone through, you know, depending girls and boys, the Girl Scouts, all the sporting events. And, you know, some of those relationships with those parents are very strong relationships to this day. Not only for me as an adult and to be sharing and bringing up your children, but also for your children to see that you're interested in their lives. You're also part of this community. And that's what it says to you. You know, it's important for you to, to be with, you know, to know other parents of where your children are going or to make decisions, you know, about who their playmates are. So that, that's a very positive thing. I, I'm sure everybody sitting here in all of our lives. Uh, I don't know if the question has I have already is that um, because I was late. Uh, I'm doing a homework with children well sometimes when I have whatever time little time that I have um, for them. But um, what I find is lacking um, geography because sometimes when they do intro studies and they study history about Egypt or about Rome or about Italy, and when we're doing this little game, they have no idea what Italy is or where Egypt is or I wonder if that's in the plan to include some more geography in the school. You know what, I'm hearing this everywhere. I'm hearing it, I think I've heard it at, at each one of the places that I've been during the listening tour. So, you know, obviously this is an issue. We have a curriculum subcommittee with our school committee. I need to bring in, you know, my department heads and we need to really start to take a look at why this seems to be lacking. You know, is it lacking? because of all the other mandates coming down, because you're right, it is important for our kids to, when I, I can't stand here and tell you it's a global economy, and that when we're bringing in all of the new testing and the common core and park, because we need our kids to be competitive in these, this so-called global economy, it would be nice if they know where the global economy lies. So, you know, it, it, it is something that I'm hearing in every one of the sites, and, you know, I will take a look at it, and and have an answer for you. Um, <clears throat> all right, um, the last time I was here, uh, this woman, uh, sorry, I don't remember your name, um, and this other woman here spoke of geography, and she spoke about language. Um, do you think that those other subjects are suffering because of the new mandates of Common Core State Standards, which says that it focuses at fewer classes at a greater depth? I wouldn't say they're suffering because of that. We have certain time that we dedicate to English language arts and literacy blocks for our younger children. Uh, we still try to you know, make sure math is a strong block. Science is new under our MCAS testing that's happening right now. So you're right, their priorities that we do focus on you know, throughout the state as far as our MCAS testing. If your children have to pass MCAS in science, in English language arts, and math, you bet that that's our priority. And I have to make sure that they have a firm foundation in that. So what else is suffering? We make sure that, I was in a district today that the kids have phys ed you know, every other week. You know, we in our district have phys ed every week. They have art, they have music. We have tried to make sure that we continue to have all of the subjects and is something suffering? I'm sure it is. Um, you know, again, something that I'll look at, but I wouldn't say that because of the Common Core or PARC, that that's the reason that... I'm not sure what you just asked. Are you talking about PARC and Common Core? Uh, it was certainly passed by Governor Patrick, and we have accepted it as a state. Well, right now, we're still testing for MCAS. So I'm talking about the mandates of your MCAS testing, which is our present system for how your children graduate, get accepted to colleges, go on to colleges. So that's what I'm talking about presently. And is something suffering? You know, it probably is. That is our focus and our priority. And even when we talked about, again, education for drugs, you know, health, I'm starting to think, okay, how do we get that into the curriculum? So more importantly though, you know, when I hear the geography, you know, I can't think of anything more important than our kids understanding the world around them if they certainly have those concepts down. The thing about the geography, I'm sorry, just jumping. 
The thing about it is that it's such a simple thing to fit in. It doesn't have to take away from anything else that, you know, it's so easy. What I have done is I just make it my at home and summertime project that they learn the map. Like they've never actually had to do the full US map and, you know, and Europe and Africa. And I just take them one at a time and make it my summertime and after school project. They just have to learn one country every day or something like that. That's, I do it on my own, but it definitely should be something. They you do know, and, and having been an elementary school teacher in the district for a number of years, and then a middle school teacher, you know, that was one of our focuses. That got as much attention as science, as English language arts. Every subject had a certain amount of time. And you're right, the times have changed and our focus has changed and it probably is something that's suffering. Uh, and, and, you know, again, like what was mentioned here, I'm sure all of you do it in your homes. You probably talk about the states. You probably talk about the capitals. I'm sure you talk about the continents. I'm sure you share with them visuals, and especially, you know, with your access to computers and websites and all of the information that they take in. I'm sure that's a job you're doing at home. Well, I'm not finished. To add, I'm, I'm sorry to say your name, to add to what you are saying, I'm not, I'm not complaining about these core classes, so, so many math classes, because I love it. I don't know if they love it, but uh, I love it because in everything, in all the subjects that they're going to encounter in college, it has to do with math and science. And if they don't have those basic foundations, they certainly won't do well in school. I'm not uh, complaining, I just wanted to know if there's a way that we can incorporate these. And that's what this tour is about. The listening tour is about sharing with us. I've heard you on the languages. I've heard about the schedule of the high school. I loved your idea about Rockton High open house in the fall so parent can, parent can make an informed decision, just like is happening with a number of the area high schools. These are great feedback for a superintendent coming in. You know, complaining is fine. You know, and you know, it was last week when I was at East Middle School, and I had a number of bilingual parents there, and we did have to talk through an interpreter. But the one thing I realized, and some of you were there with me that evening, the superintendent can't go there once. You know, that to me, and I told the parents I would be available at any time, you know, if it meant, you know, a weekend that I went there, because parents might be working during the weekend. It's, you know, an effort for them to come out at night. So I'm available to you to hear the complaints, not just as a new superintendent coming in. I'll try to make sure I have a schedule throughout the year where you have access to speak to the superintendent. At one point, I was talking about Thursday afternoons, and it would almost be like a, an open door policy. People could come in, and the superintendent would make themselves available. I'm still thinking you know, about you know, something like that, and maybe be at a different place in the district on Thursdays, but that becomes, or whatever day it is, that becomes a time where you can come and share some of your concerns. Hi, um, I'm a parent of a student in, in an inclusion class at the Angelo, and I'm a parent at, in a city resource room at the Ashfield. And both programs are wonderful, but from what I understand, when they get to the high school, it's not, and the caliber is not the same. Is, is, is there something, is there plans to do something about that? I've been hearing that it's not a... Okay, when you say the caliber, can you just explain that a little further? Services, what do you... They're not as included. That they're not as challenged as they are in, in the middle school level that, you know, that's not okay because when you hear me talk about MCAS or MCAS Alt, or we talk about the park testing coming in, the one thing that you'll continue to hear me say is the rigor is very challenging for these kids. So it isn't okay for me to hear that we're challenging them at an elementary level, we're challenging them at a middle school level, whether it's inclusion, they're held to the same standards. So, you know, I'm not pleased to hear that at the high school. Um, you know, I know we're looking to be a little bit more inclusive with some of the kids. Uh, you, know, I, I'm not, you know, some of our numbers with our ASD classes, you know, we're kind of caught by surprise. And when I say that, you know, the numbers have grown, and I was just at actually another district, an urban district, and it, it's the same thing, you know, throughout many of our districts, that this is a population that is growing, and we need to service this population, you know, much better. Um, what, one of the things you heard me talk about, if you were there, you know, listening to the East tour, I did have a number of special needs parents. So two things are going to happen. One is we're looking to have parents advocate for each other. So we're looking to have a place in the district, a facility, a room, an area, 
where we give you all kinds of resources, where you have an opportunity to set an agenda, classes for parents, discussions about what you want to see as special needs parents in the district. And more importantly, it was brought to my attention that we need to have special need parents as part of the law advising our school committee about what they would like to see have for their children in the district. So this is something that's coming. Um, I will be talking to the school committee about it. I've talked to the director of special education, and we are moving forward to make sure we have those things in place. So that becomes your job to sit and talk to the school committee and talk to the superintendent very publicly to give us our marching orders about what we need to do better. Hi, um, my name is Leona Martin, and we have a daughter who just started Brockton High. She's actually a special needs child. Um, and to the comment of the lady that just said something, I have to say, she's really being challenged. Um, the classes that she's in and the work she's doing, quite honestly, I'm surprised, because I didn't expect it to be at that caliber, um, but it is. Are you talking an inclusion class at the high no, school? It's, or? it's the high school she's in special needs. It's not inclusion. Um, she's got math, science, you know, vocabulary. They're doing a lot. And her homework is very challenging. So we're happy about that. Um, so I guess it maybe depends on where they're placed, although it shouldn't. But um, she's really getting some good uh, classes and has some good classes. Um, is she coming from another public school district? Was she in Brockton? Well, she went to the uh, Asheville, as a matter of fact. So, so my question is around, um, you know, the special needs kids and graduation from the high school. Um, we've heard lots of different things in terms of, do they get a diploma? Do they get a certificate? You know, what happens with them? Do they walk for graduation? Because, I mean, these kids are working just as hard as anyone else. And it's not fair if they can't graduate and be a part of a bigger celebration. So I wondered what you could speak well, to on that. I actually attended, and not as a parent, so this past June, I attended as your superintendent-elect the graduation up at Brockton High School. And one of the things they've done in the past couple of years is they've been much more inclusive of not just our special needs youngsters, and I'll address what they get, you know, for the diploma or certificate of attainment. But uh, youngsters that go to Edison Academy, which is one of our alternative high schools, you know, Champion High School, different pathways. So finally, you know, with 900 kids on that field, everybody has an opportunity. Every parent gets a chance to see their kids graduate and walk across the field and have the relatives there and celebrate like every other family. Now that being said, I get when you talk about you know, passing the MCAS or the MCAS all for many of our special needs youngsters, and there are some youngsters that are special needs that will never be able to pass that test. And they end up, you know, with our state mandate, they end up getting a certificate of attainment you know, versus the high school diploma. Um, what we need to do is, again, make sure that if we have kids that have special needs and can pass with the you know, MCAS alt, that needs to be an option for those kids, and we need to provide extra supports to make sure that things are in place with their portfolio assessment so they are able to get you know, their diploma, their high school diploma. So is that something that you're looking to do? Because I think it would be a great idea if we could get some teachers and some parents to work on something toward attaining that goal. OK, making sure, again, now I just said to you that we would have to work to make sure that every child that qualifies for the MCAS alt has that opportunity if they're a special needs youngster. Um, you know, that's something, you know, I'll put that out there, you know, to you as parents. If it's something that you think we need to work on at the high school, we can put a task force together of parents, sitting with teachers, sitting with our administrators. We have, let me tell you tonight what's going on tomorrow night. I received two calls, I'll tell you, from your high school SPED <coughs> department head up there. And one of the things she was excited about was we have uh, up at the high school, it's called the Fine Arts Cafe. And for the first time in many years, some of our special needs students are actually, I mean, they're working in that Fine Arts Cafe. 
They're learning a trade, a trade that is useful to the point that they can go out and get a job. And it wasn't that way, I'm told, for a number of years. So she invited me to go to lunch. I went to lunch. It's open to the public, actually, a couple of days a week if you have an opportunity. The food is fabulous. And we went up there to make sure that, first of all, our special needs kids have access to that program. Now, those were kids that could do and could work and you know, be successful you know, in the cafe. Now, what she had going on this past week was they have a Halloween, I don't want to call it a haunted house, but a Halloween uh, get together up at the high school tomorrow night. I think they have about 500 youngsters. It's tonight. Oh, it's tonight. It was, it was oh before. my goodness. It was well, let me, well, let me tell you what happens with that. So she contacted me, and they had asked for bags of goodies from the staff, you know, to give out to the kids. So I right away said, you know, what can I send for the kids? And she said, you know what? She said, how about having the special needs kids? You know, you a superintendent order or something. We decided on pencils for kids, a Halloween pencil. The kids came up with a poem. They put the poem together. I was going to go up tomorrow night. What am I thinking? So, but pretty I, long I, yeah, I'll be pretty long, right. I'll be home with trick-or-treaters tomorrow night. But again, something that the kids were excited about doing, and, and these were truly our substantially separate you know, special needs young adults up at the high school. And they were very excited to do this project. So she is open to any kind of suggestions. She's accessible. And when I tell you somebody's out there working for your kids, she's out there working for your kids. So certainly it's something, uh, again, I'm looking at my special needs parents, you know, sitting out there. But, but I have high hopes for us as a district, really engaging the parents and pushing us as a district to do everything that we can do. I don't know if you know, but I'm a former special needs teacher of kids in a substantially separate classroom at the middle school. I taught there for 10 years at East Middle School with kids that had serious learning disabilities. Hi, um, my name is Alicia. I have three kids, three different schools. Uh, by the way, I, before I came here, I bring my son to the home the whole way. It was one great, oh, it was good. a great activity. <laughs> my son loves it. Um, I've been hearing a lot about what we want, what we need. Now, I want to see if someone else shared this thinking with me, like, um, your kids are the ones that go to school every day. What do they say about the school? What do they complain? Those, those are the, you know, like, those are my antennas to see what is going on in school. I know kids, like, I think in every single school in Brooklyn, and um, I've been hearing a lot, and I personally went through that with one of my daughters, um, cafeteria. I knew you were going to say that. Is it the chocolate chip cookie? No. <laughs> that, that seems to be the biggest complaint. The ones you have tonight are the good ones. The ones we serve to the kids during the day, there's a concern. They're healthy. No, no, actually, personal, I'm against that new thing, but okay. that's not my <laughs> field. I know it's a federal thing, so we have to respect that. Um, but, you know, I remember my middle one when she was little. She literally said to me, Mommy, I don't want to eat in the school. I don't want to eat the school food. I was like, why? You know, we have a menu, you can pick this or that. She was like, no, it's not that. Those ladies yell at us too much, and I I'm, I'm just feel like embarrassed every time they yell at me. That was when she was little and elementary, she's middle school now, you know, we went over that. But I've been hearing that a lot in family, um, even she was in middle school with, when a custodian said to her, she happened to throw up, wouldn't wait to the bathroom, and he said, won't you go and clean your, um, and as an adult, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm talking like this because that's the way they present it to us, you know, they go, ma, this is what happened, you know, so they are the one in school. Listen to them. What do they say? What do they complain? I mean, I bring this because this is what I've been hearing from a lot of friends and family kids. The lunch time is a hassle because they get yelled a lot. Now, I work for the department and I know they only have half hour to eat, 
So those minds have to, you know, speed up and, you know, they don't have all the time in the world. They have to serve everyone and they have to keep moving. But looking at the point that it's like different schools, different ages, and different people. So I think it's a concern out there. Th thank you for sharing that. So again, what the parents, I'm sorry, your first name? Alicia. Alicia. What Alicia just shared with me is in our schools, uh, and, and she's telling you to listen to your children. You know, what do the children come home and tell you about? They tell you about the playground, they tell you about the bus, they tell you about the cafeteria. They're going to tell you about what happened during the day. You probably have to pull out of them what happened in math and reading and, and things that you're probably more interested in. But that being said, I've taught in this district 37 years, and now I'm your superintendent. And the one thing I understand is I work for you. I understood it when I was a teacher. I understood that level of respect. I had respect for you as a parent. I had respect for your children in the schools, no matter who the children were. No matter who was the children, child that was a high achiever, or the child that was struggling with misbehavior. Every child had that kind of respect, and you would want that for every one of your children. When I addressed your faculty, and I had an opportunity, and could probably do it better next year, I addressed the faculty on the first day of school, your teachers, your professional staff. I then had an opportunity to invite the custodians, to invite the cafeteria workers, to invite the paraprofessionals, to invite everybody that makes us a district. And one of the things I told them is, the most important thing are the children in our school. Treat them like they're your own children, like you would want your child treated. So when I hear that, I understand, too, the intensity of coming in and needing to get through a line. You know, you have to take into account the age of the children. And I, again, I have principals out there that if they were aware of some of this, I guarantee you, if a custodian spoke to a child in that way, and you made sure that you shared that information with your school officials, your principals, your assistant principals, that wouldn't go on. Because in this, in this district, there should be a feeling of respect for everybody that comes through the doors. And that comes from the top down. So I, I'm sorry if you've experienced things like that. Make sure I know about that. That is important to me. I also spent in the district a number of years as a school adjustment counselor. And every child needs to feel like they belong. You know, the best thing that you can do, and I, you know, Mr. Murray, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull you out. I look at him when I'm driving down West Elm Street and there's thousands of kids you know, our school has just been dismissed, Brockton High, West Middle School, and he's walking with your children. Mr. Campbell, I saw him here earlier. You know, he's right by your side. He's walking with you. And the kids know that. He respects them enough to make sure that kids are walking along, behaving, having fun after school, and there's no nonsense, so your children are comfortable coming to school. And I see that with so many of the principals. They should be welcoming your children in the morning. They should be welcoming with you as parents. One of the things, and, and you can really judge me on this at the end of, you know, presently my three-year term. I want to know at the end of this, if you feel more engaged as a parent. Just today, we went to a workshop on something called a parent portal. I want to be able to have you get information about your kids in a timely manner. Find out information about homework. Find out information about grades. So you're not waiting for that paper report card to come home. You're going to be there with that report card because you have it before they ever walk in the door when the report cards come out. So we're starting to look at ways of engaging parents in, in many, many ways. And I hope that at the end of all of this, you judge me in that manner as your superintendent. Because don't forget, I was a parent of children in the Brockton Public Schools. I have to say that um, I'm a parent of a junior at the high school right now, and my daughter's an eighth grader at um, North End. Um, I did work, and I work for the Human Service, so I deal with all systems and all children, all types, everything. So I think the biggest thing for me that has made my children's education, um, well-being, socially, emotionally, psychologically, um, balanced is that it's the constant communication that I've had with the um, teachers at the school, um, vice versa, and ensuring that the children, my kids, learn that it's important that the communication continues. With that being said, it has to start from elementary all the way to high school. And what I found is that elementary was great. And it was a struggle for me, who's a professional, who's, who says, yeah, I've got it on point, and junior high, I was like, ah, I lost control. 
But it's very important to teach the parents as well that you could regain that control. And to be able to teach your children that communication is very important. Every parent share conference, my kids with me, they're not outside in the waiting room. You're gonna hear the good and the bad, and you're gonna process the consequences for good and bad. And I think it's important that we try to provide some tools um, for parents who are not able to go mm -hmm. in the morning or after school. And, I, and I'm a strong believer in end grade. I love it for whatever teachers participate in end grade. I love it because I'm able to get on the computer, see what grades they're getting before that paperwork comes yeah. out. We're looking for this for the whole district. We have a management system called Infinite Campus. And this is one of the applications on Infinite Campus. We actually just went to Whitman Hanson today. And they have a similar, you know, infinite campus, and they've used this for probably five, six, seven years. And one of the things I'll tell you that I said to the administrators there is, you know what, we're not going to make excuses about not everybody has access to the internet, and we need to treat all parents the same. You can now get it on your iPhones. How many here have iPhones? I bet all of your hands will go up. You have some kind of a tablet, an iPhone, an iPad, an i something where you can certainly get information you know, about your children. So it is something we're looking at to empower you to be the parent that you need to be. You can see the attendance. Yeah. Let me tell you something, again, as a parent of somebody from Brockton High School, I loved it that in my office at Central, right next to me was the officer for attendance in the district. And when she became a senior at the high school, we bought a second-hand car because it freed us. And she was able to get a second job, and we weren't driving her all over the place. And I say that because when you give your child that responsibility, you expect them, and when they're seen, you should try to give them privileges. And one of the things I would check every day, and I loved that he was right next to me, I would check, I'd walk over and see what time she got to school. And I'd be able to find out those things. And that's what, again, a parent portal will tell you every day that your child is there in a very timely manner so that you would be put on notice right away if your child wasn't where they needed to be. And it's, it's all about, again, empowering us and letting us be the parents that we need to be. And also giving the kids responsibility. I find that even if you don't have a computer, what I like about Brockton High is that whether you're doing well or not, they implemented the uh, weekly green progress report where it's the kid's responsibility to bring it to the teacher. So if you don't have the phone or the computer or a laptop or iPod, there is still the old school manual written way where the teacher can write down the, you know, how he or she's doing academically and behaviorally. Every Friday, my kid has to bring it. Doing well, I still want to know. That's something you've set up, I'm going to guess. Exactly. But the Brockton High has that system as an option. So it is utilized, it can be utilized by parents on a voluntary mm -hmm. basis, but it gives the kid, the child, responsibility himself or herself. That it, it's up to you as well to kind of keep up with you. Kathy, think we have time for two more questions. Because of our Boston Red Sox? No, we just have time. <laughs> <laughs> we well, I understand. Two, but we're coming I understand. To the end. Hi, um, my name is Joanna Silverman. I have um, a daughter, S. Kennedy, and I, you know, I've listened to everything that people have said tonight, and I, I think one thing as an educator and as a parent that I think is missing, it's not just for this district, is a social emotional um, curriculum. And no matter what the MCAT scores are, no matter how well they do in class, if they can't get along with other people, if they cannot work in a group, if they don't have self-regulation, they're not getting far in life. And so I think we need to do a better job. No, I'm just not talking about this district. I think as a society, we have to bring humanity back into teaching. And we have to start teaching these kids to think about other people and having a curriculum that makes them a good person. And so I would love that to be a focus. So you're talking, so, you know, you're not just talking character education, though. You're no, also I'm talking, talking like true, like I have thought right. about you. We're thinking about each other. All of that. Do you know one of our principals again at the Huntington School, um, which has been one of our focus schools, brought in a group. She actually saw a group that would come into the school. They teach the teachers and build capacity on how to play in a playground. You know, I never thought that that would be something that you had to teach kids. She said the results have been unbelievable. They go out, kids are involved, you know, people are playing together, they understand how rules form, um, and, and it does, you know, develop. But again, you know, just being out in the playground is a teachable moment for our kids in this society. And this is not the first time I've heard about the social and emotional piece. We talked about it with special needs kids, ASD kids, that need to, again, understand how to get along with other kids or understand you know, social cues and, and many of those things that some of us take for granted. So you're not the first one sharing that with me. The drugs, you eliminate the bullying, like you're getting at the heart of the real issue here. Because if I feel good about myself, I don't make those choices. So, so.
when, when, again, when you talk about time and learning, and when I talk about my days at, at East Junior High at the time, we had a homeroom period where every teacher did some type of a little elective. Somebody had a pet club, somebody had, it didn't matter what kind of club you had, what mattered is we tried to make sure at that age that every child belonged. Because what was really happening, they felt a part of something, they were making friends, that was then the kid that you sit with at the lunch table so you're not sitting alone. And all of that, again, is teachable moments for kids. You know, interacting in a safe place with a caring adult. All of those are your, you know, your promises um, that we make here in the city, Brockton's promise. So, you know, good suggestion. It's not the first time that I've heard it. And I think this is the last question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, no? Okay, now, uh, I never introduced myself. I'm Diana Mark. Um, well, one of the things I do support her, we, we have gone through a lot, uh, actually, um, in the way of social, in the schools, also in the elementary, especially, uh, and all that kind of bullying and, you know, things like that. But right now, uh, what I actually wanted to ask you, maybe you can talk a little bit about the high school. Um, like, my son is going into ninth grade, right, next year. And there's been, between his, um, his grandparents and, you know, myself, there's no talk about, is he going to the Brockton High? Is he going somewhere else? Um, how, what, what do we expect? What do we expect in the way of um, bullying, drugs, uh, gangs, security, uh, safety? Um, I've heard, you know, I know the Brockton High in the way of academics is awesome, mm -hmm. but what worries me personally is all the other stuff, too. And are there any other high schools that are available as a choice? Well, I think Brockton High is certainly your best choice for a high school. <laughs> um, you know, but, but really, you ask a very serious question, and again, the woman that just left, you heard one of her questions to me last week was, a couple of things she asked. First of all, she said, why aren't you having an open house like Cardinal Spellman, like Southeastern Regional, uh, so that we can see the school, not in March or April, when we kind of have made that choice because that's our hometown public school, but so we can make an informed decision about, and it really wasn't just that, about making a decision. You want to come in and you want to see the high school. She also asked if they could come in during the day. Now, that would be a little bit difficult if I had a thousand new parents plus coming in, you know, it'd be a little bit disruptive to the educational setting. That's probably unrealistic. Uh, but as far as what to expect, I walk in there every day. Now, when I'm there, not there every day right now, but when I'm in Brockton High School, people hold the doors for me. When I say people, I'm talking about your kids. You know, kids are getting along. I was there watching their morning and their afternoon announcements. I was there two different times of the day. They walk in, they know the staff in that front office. They know, now we have over 4,000 kids. They knew those kids by names. They were the kids actually giving out the morning announcements. The announcements were about all the clubs that were gonna go on that afternoon. They were excited because they had a day, I think it was a day of everybody was wearing the Boston Red Sox regalia. They were um, talking about their football team and things that were happening on the weekend. There is something for every child up at Brockton High School. You know, as you said, academics are excellent. We offer AP, IB classes. You know, hopefully the rigor is there for your children. If they're special needs children, there's a place for the special needs children. Now, is it an optimal setting for everybody? We can do better. Um, you mentioned, uh, again, uh, about safety and security. Are there drugs? Is there alcohol? You know, it does mirror society. I can't stand here and tell you that there aren't those things up there, but what I will tell you is we pay attention to everything. We make sure that your children have a safe environment to go to. We're very, very serious about the safety of our children, not just at Brockton High School, but in all of our schools. If there's a child that is having difficulty up at Brockton High School because of behavior, because of bullying, because a weapon might have been brought to school, you know, if, if it's anything, when I say a weapon, it could be a box cutter. You just saw what happened in the town of, unfortunately, in the town of Danvers. You know, these are things that we take seriously. And your children, we have, I think, five alternative schools. We have schools where if a child does not make it at Brockton High School, they can go to the Keith Center. We have a Pathway Center, a Champion High School. We have the Edison Academy that goes on at night. 
Not every child does make it at Brockton High School, but we make sure that children have an opportunity to certainly, if they have to go to an alternative setting, many times there's an opportunity to come back once they've regulated a particular behavior. So again, standing here as your superintendent, I think it's a wonderful high school. It's a great place to be during the day. I'm not sure if any of you are teachers. I see a number of teachers that are here, middle school teachers, elementary teachers. But it's again, it's a great place to be at. There are young people, they're our future. They're again, in the arts, they're practicing for the band. You know, many, many good things are happening in our Brockton community. And it is what I call our flagship. So again, I, I, I hope you consider Brockton High School. Um, we will try to do a good job making sure that you have the information you need to feel good about your son going up there as a ninth grader next year. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.